Okay, great. Let's welcome Katie King. She's coming on shortly. By the way, folks, I think the uh, there she is. Katie, good morning. Good morning. Hi, greetings from the UK. Where are you based at the moment? I'm also in the UK. So great. Probably very close to each other right now. Um, wonderful to see you, Katie. Um, I, uh, I'm so impressed by your career trajectory to date. Um, it's so important to, 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 to get sort of insight and feedback from people who've already kind of led the way in, in I would say, educating other people about the state of AI. So um, fantastic to have you with us. Um, Katie, let me not eat any more of your t speaking time. I think the audience really is uh, is very keen to hear uh, from you directly. Uh, so let me uh, leave it to you, and I'll come back uh, after your uh, after your uh, seminar, and we'll have a chit chat about uh, about what uh, what you talked about then. Amazing! Thank you very much. Great. So let's get started then. So um, yeah, hopefully you're seeing my screen now in full screen in the PowerPoint. Um, we've got an hour, forty five minutes, and some time for questions. And I think this is one of the key topics on every business's agenda at the moment. And it's a really, I'd say it's a pivotal time for the HR professionals, whatever level you are. So I'm going to be talking to you about how you can harness AI in HR for competitive advantage and doing so in a, in a very ethical way as well. That's so, so important. So Hong, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm spending my whole time at the moment traveling around the world, working with HR professionals, as well as chief marketing officers, chief legal counsel across every industry sector. I spent a lot of time in highly regulated industries just recently, like financial services and retail and healthcare, um, but many, many others as well. Um, I've written two books. One was published, the one on the top right there um, a year or so ago, and the other one back in 2019. And the world was very, very different there when we were looking at AI. Um, and uh, honestly, this is not AI washing. This is me saying to you, it doesn't matter if you've written books, if you've got degrees in this subject. This space is moving really, really fast. So whether you're 57 like me, whether you're 27, it doesn't matter. AI... I'm not going to be here to teach you code. So this is not about technology. This is about how do we apply these new tools and platforms and techniques and ways of thinking to our world. Um, and so, you know, I want you to walk away feeling empowered, realizing this is a pivotal time for HR and that actually, you know, let's not be frightened of it. So with that in mind, we're going to do two quick polls. So I'll stop sharing my screen in a moment and we'll go across to the Slido. And I want you to think for a moment about two things. First of all, what do you fear most about AI? Is it about making your role redundant, impact on your privacy or changing culture and dehumanizing? So let me stop sharing for a moment and we will make those Slidos live um, in a few seconds. So interesting. So vote if you would for us. Um, what do you fear most about AI? Making my role redundant. So at the moment, we're seeing 60, well, it's changing. So we'll give it a, a few seconds to, um, to finish. But it really varies. And I think one of the main points I would make here is that AI is not about the big, shiny robot coming and taking all of our jobs. In a moment, I'll take you through exactly what AI is and the different layers of it. But so far, it looks like we're getting most of the votes for changing culture and dehumanizing. And I'm not surprised by that. I'm pleased to see that everyone's not seeing it all being about the job being redundant or the role being redundant. And of course, privacy is so important. And I'm going to talk about ethics. But changing culture and dehumanizing um, is, is really interesting. If we could go to the next poll as well, please. And then I'll talk back to on my slides and talk about those as well. So, so that's about that dehumanizing, which I'll address in a moment. And then the next is the, the more positive spin. So what do we believe is going to be the biggest benefit of AI to your current role? What do you believe it's going to be? Is it going to be about productivity? Is it going to be about actually HR being able to offer more strategic value to the wider organization? Or perhaps some AI HR tools to understand your employees better. Interested to see what this is going to look like. 
I'm guessing it looks like the first two are um, are going to be the main ones there. So I actually believe the second is so true. Um, all the different layers of HR, from learning and development, from the corporate culture, the upskilling side, the attracting talent, AI can play a major role in there. And every job function is having to be upskilled and reevaluate re its role. And AR can, HR can play a pivotal role in that. So it looks like it's coming out pretty equal between the productivity, absolutely. Um, and I'm going to share some tools with you. So fantastic. Thank you. Thank you to the team for, um, for making those polls live for us. So let me come back to, um, to my slides. So I will address those as we go along. So um, you know, the fact is the world is changing and we have to really be considering, will our organisation, will our team, our department, will you individually change with it? And already we've talked for a few minutes about AI. What do we mean by AI? We don't mean something very artificial. The term is very misleading. Artificial intelligence says to everyone something non-human, something scary, something robotic. A much better term is augmented intelligence, big data, adding insights. And I often do this finger in the air. And what it means is we're taking away the guesswork from what we do. And by having insights on our staff, potential staff, clients, what is required of the, the legal team, the tech team, the, the board, you know, those insights are really, really valuable. So AI is this multifaceted family of technology. Let's go through briefly now what that looks like. We've got interactive AI, okay, where the AI systems can engage in pretty human-like conversation. And again, another definition, we're talking here about imitating or mimicking intelligent human behavior, okay? The family of AI, which has been around for 70 or more years, can do that. Think about chatbots, smart assistants that your bank, your you know, retailers you interact with. Think of your Amazon Echo and all of those kinds of tools. Visual AI as well, you might find this in driverless vehicles, in the kind of facial recognition technology that your bank may use to initiate a transaction. Insurance companies are using it where if you have a car accident, you upload the imagery of the damaged vehicle and the AI helps process that claim quickly and make customer experience much more slick. Functional AI is where the AI is scanning data, finding finding unusual patterns of behavior, dependencies, okay? So our human brains are incredible. We've not yet cracked exactly how the neurons in the brain work, but that doesn't matter, okay? The AI, we might speak one up to five or six languages, foreign languages. The AI can cope with hundreds of languages across a massive amount of data, which we can't. So yes, we have the creativity, we are sentient, we are empathetic. AI can't do that yet. Um, and so, you know, functional AI might be robotics. It might be sensors on a manufacturing line. And so it's this intelligence which is saying to the machine, you need to shut down before there's a problem. Then we start to get into areas that HR and marketing can really take advantage of, like sentiment analysis, risk assessment, a retailer using analytic AI to forecast demand, you know, has a very green element to that in terms of inventory and not overstocking. And then the biggie, which everyone's been talking about for, a, for the past year or so, Gen AI, where the AI computing, the algorithm is generating outputs. It might be code, it might be a 3D rendering, it might be video. It's actually creating content. And that could be used for multiple purposes. And so it's not all about chat GPT. There's Bard, there's Dali, there's many, many others. But HR marketing teams can use this for writing uh, manuals, for writing job descriptions, for writing content, for, you know, all kinds of purposes. And we'll explore that a little bit more as we go along. So at the heart of 
HR and people management now are a whole raft of new tools and platforms, technologies that become your ally, become a new way of working. And we don't necessarily need to be an organization that is head of everything and takes all the risks, the innovator, but we don't want to be the laggard. We don't want to get left behind. We don't want other organizations to erode our market share. And so in every job function, AI is now reshaping the tasks that we do. Let's look now at AI, particularly in your main job functions, HR, people management. So in talent acquisition, we're going to use tools to make the hiring process much more effective, much more quick. And so it could be scanning keywords, um, scanning LinkedIn profiles, doing stages of the interview process, finding that cultural fit. But again, we mustn't lose sight of having the human in the loop, because if you give everything over to technology, you're going to get some pushback because graduates maybe wanting to join your organization might say, I don't want to work for that company. They I've not interfaced with one human being in that whole process. So use it, but don't lose sight of the need to fact check, have a human in the loop and so on. There's loads of AI now used to, you know, to really understand personalization. It's a bit of a paradox. I've got a whole chapter in it in my second book, The Paradox of Personalization. So creating benefits packages, understanding sentiment analysis, doing more detailed performance reviews. AI can really help with that. So with big data, and that's really what AI is, AI feeds off big data, we get insights. And the insights enable us to offer a much more uh, personalized service. Data automation, you know, I used to call it the three Ds, the dirty, dull, and dangerous. It's automating some of the tedious work that every job function's got. It might be document verification, transferring info, all of the shifts and vacation times and automated comms maybe with um, FAQs handled by a, a really smart chatbot. And then the last one as well, which I think is the key really, is HR really being um, not overwhelmed by AI, but adding real value, taking us up the food chain, helping with automating onboarding, reskilling. So HR people have got to be reskilled to use these AI tools to do their job function better. But part of HR's role is strategically getting the organization ready for the next stage. And that means upskilling other departments and getting other departments to really understand the role of AI in their different job functions. So AI in marketing, AI in sales, AI in the law. Let's look at, to bring that alive, some real world case studies of that in practice. So, um, you know, many organizations, not all the big ones, I'm going to name some here, um, but we've got people like in the food space, food courier, Just Eat, and there's a tool called HireView, and they're using it to, you know, to have a much more skills-based approach to their hiring, moving away from traditional screening of CVs or resumes and switching to these AI-powered chatbots so that the, the chatbot can screen questions, help do cognitive tests, and this has had a big impact. You can see the stats there reducing recruitment time by half, yeah, from two weeks to just seven days. So big impact there on time, you know, the resources of the organization, the time, um, et cetera. Electrolux too. So talent shortages they were faced with and they digitized their talent acquisition process so that they could elevate the employee, the recruiter, the hiring manager's experience. So it's about experience. It's about time reduction and costs to hire. So they've used um, an AI driven fit scoring so they can match candidates, do interviews, all kinds of things. And again, some impressive stats there of the conversion rates, the decrease in incomplete applications and decreasing how long it actually takes to hire candidates. And a few more examples 
So Starbucks as well, using, um, you know, using their platforms for for hiring. And they've done a great job, Starbucks, in personalizing their products and services and using that knowledge of people to attract the talent. Shell as well. Shell get, you know, hundreds of thousands of applications each year for their graduate program. So it's about streamlining that. It's about, you know, automating the process with these virtual assessments and video interviews. Again, cost savings, um, time reductions, really, really important. And the onboarding as well. On While we're talking about onboarding, in my uh, second book, I have a, a bank that actually failed initially with AI. And they used it to start with as a chatbot. And it was quite early days. Staff weren't on board. They hadn't communicated with their staff and they were frightened of what was coming. It was going to take all their jobs. And clients found the chatbot really gimmicky. This is going back a couple of years. So they iterated and they then went away, used the AI in a different way and used it for onboarding. So onboarding of new employees is really important. And that's what Shell have done as well. So onboarding, you know, thousands of employees in multiple countries, thinking about training and and so on, and then using a mobile app to make that learning micro learning and using gamification so that they could boost the participation. So, you know, you can see their average course completion rates above 75% there too. So, you know, some big um, impacts there. So, so far, what I wanted to give you a good flavor of is, first of all, how are you feeling about it? And we'll come to the Q&A and maybe address some of those um, concerns and hopes um, shortly as well. What is AI? So big data, what isn't it? It's not that or singing or dancing um, robot coming and taking your jobs. And then we've looked at specifically AI in the HR and people management side. Now what I want to do is think about who can you turn to? And I'm not recommending tools necessarily. I'm giving you a flavor of all of the different um, span of tools that are on the market. But a word of, um, I say warning, it's an opportunity perhaps, but keep tabs on this because this changes by the week, by the month, new tools are coming up all the time. You know, generative AI has just come exploded onto the market in the past year or so. Sora was launched, you know, in the last month, and that's changing the game um, as far as imagery, text, video based imagery, and so on. But we've got these chatbots and virtual assistants, and you can see some of the key players there, like Amelia, Gen AI, not just ChatGPT and Bard and Midjourney and Dali. Um, but others, some of the marketing teams are using Jasper AI because it's been trained by marketeers and using it for content writing. If you think of it, every layer of job functions that we as HR do or our teams that we've got to upskill um, and retain as, as staff, every layer of what everybody does has got some productivity gains potentially functional areas so think about marketing it's broken down into events search engine optimization crm etc etc pr and so on and there is a a number of ai tools that do all these different things and they don't mean that the people in these jobs are redundant they are new tools think about digital marketing think about the digital world and think about software as a service for the last 10 or 15 years we started using digital tools to assist us. And this is the next wave of tools that we are going to use to improve what we do. A whole bunch of them there for, um, for public relations, for getting content media, you know, thinking about your brand, thinking about getting positive editorial coverage and so on. So a whole range. And you might be thinking, well, I'm not in marketing. I'm not in sales. I'm not in PR. Your job as HR is to motivate the team to help the company achieve its strategic goals, to make sure that teams are upskilled, that the learning and development is appropriate. Um, and therefore, you know, it's important that they, you are helping them get to grips with all of these different areas. And that's where I think HR, people management, they can go up the food chain, become the right hand person of, if you're already on the board, fantastic. But if not, be 
the right hand person of you know the board the management team so that they're prepared for this digital disruption and are ahead of the pack so a whole range of sales tools there as well uh, that your teams can take advantage of and ultimately we are all in sales and marketing because if you think about it whether it's an internal audience or an external audience Fundamentally, what we're in business for, which is really a definition of marketing, is satisfying customer needs profitably, unless we're in the third sector or the charitable sector. But satisfying customer needs, the internal customer doing a great job then for the external client or customer. And what are we there for? We're there to make a difference. We're there to enrich the human experience. We're there to think about our purpose as an organization. So HR is playing a big role, specifically AI and HR tools. You can see here, um, and you're very welcome, um, you know, through Better Works to get a PDF of my slides if you'd like a, a copy of these. But, you know, everything from spotting bias in job postings to employee record management, um, employee satisfaction insights, there's a whole range of tools there. And I've spent the last months in the Europe in America, in um, the Middle East, helping HR directors and their teams to get to grips with uh, exactly this, the tools to help them and the bigger picture of preparing the organization. Now, every job function can take advantage of some of these, what I call everyday AI tools, which are for productivity, for example. So, it might be um, Otter AI. Anybody use that, perhaps? Uh, you do a one-hour Zoom meeting. You get the audio recording. You upload it into the free Otter AI or a premium paid version. And it does an amazing transcription. Now, a few years ago when I wrote book one, it was no, nowhere near as accurate as it is today. So these tools are getting better and better all of the time. Fireflies, I often go to a Zoom meeting and someone's joined with their Fireflies assistant, which is note taking and so on. And then, of course, with Microsoft, you've got Microsoft 365 Copilot and there's AI productivity tools built into um, Teams and Outlook and Word and, and so on. So um, it's important. So far, I've been talking in a pretty positive way about AI and HR and people management and how you can take advantage of it. I mentioned at the very start of this webinar the word ethics. Really important that we are compliant and that we think about the big picture. And so I want to share with you uh, some of the big major issues related to that. So um, updates, I'm sure some of you will be familiar with this. And the fact that this is in the EU and you're joining from all around the world, you know, we are all around the world learning from one another. Uh, but regulation has arrived in the European Union as of the last week or so, March 13th when the EU Parliament approved what is effectively the world's first binding law on AI, the AI Act. And at the heart of this act is safety, compliance with fundamental rights. That's really, really important. Um, democracy, the rule of law, environmental sustainability. These are, you know, we're trying to protect the world, our communities, our staff, from high risk AI. Okay, so it's going to come around the world, but at different times. So let me just talk, um, you know, a little, for a little bit longer there about um, about some of those topics. So privacy is really important at the heart of, of, of you know, a lot of um, AI is consent. If I give you consent to use my data, then I'm going to expect some benefits. I give you consent to use my data. Let me give you an example of that. So um, a, a hospitality brand like TGI Fridays, they used to treat people in very broad, homogenous groups, just like the banks and the retailers, other retailers, where they would have said, uh, like me, uh, 45 to 60, now female. Now they could say, 
female, Katie, comes into our restaurant twice a month. She loves um, meat. Her husband's vegan, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If they've got that big data on me, which I've consented to use, then they can give me a great service in the restaurant and they can serve me through the marketing they do to me. OK, so that's just an example. But we've got to think about people's data. We've got to think about um, bias. OK, the term is garbage in, garbage out. OK, if you have a very poor data set, it's not diverse. You know, I'm thinking back to many brands that have been using um, AI in HR over the years. One of them springs to mind, which is Unilever. And what they did was use AI to assist with the hiring of a much more diverse group of people. So if we use diverse data sets and we train our data in the right way and we don't let bias in the training and in the practice of it, then we are going to have a much more eclectic ability to do that. So privacy, consent, um, the regulations. Regulations are coming. Yeah, regulations coming at a national level, international level, but also in our industry. So you might be in HR and gradually AI will come to the HR function, but you might be in HR in a retail environment or in a telecoms environment or in a you know any kind of sector. The next slide I wanted to share with you is you'll see, whoa, that's very, very busy. Um, and it's my scorecard for success. And what a lot of organizations are doing is gamifying this scorecard. OK, they are um, using the QR code. It's all free um, and they are going away and they're working as HR teams with the management team. And they are thinking, right, how do we really get to grips with AI across our business? Let me take you through it. What you do is you give yourself a score of naught to five across these 10 areas. OK, and let's go through them now. So effectively, this is about do we have, number one, the right mindset for change? HR is critical to helping the organization reassure, inspire the teams, help them understand the vision of the company, help them get on board with change through town hall communications, through training, through all kinds of ways. And so we're thinking here with the first one, do we, as a company, do we have that vision are we open? Are we flexible? Are we realistic? And so you would go away and give yourself a score of naught, one, two, three, four, five there. OK, if you score under 20 when you've completed this with your teams, then you are certainly much, much more traditional. You're uh, maybe a novice in AI. You're you know, needing to really get on board and structure your strategy and go away and research the tools and the vendors. If you score in the middle, then you are transitioning, okay? It's got great start, but you need to go away and look at the gaps, identify where you need to focus. And then if you do score 36 and above, you are already exploiting many of the benefits of AI. So go away, you know, don't be complacent if you've got that, keep up that good work. But many people fall into the middle category, and many, many are still very traditional as well. So don't beat yourselves up if you are going away, doing this scoring and realizing, because the very fact that we're here today, you're listening, hopefully you're learning about the impact of AI in HR. And this is about a pragmatic set of tools to help you go away and take advantage of it. Okay, so that was number one, was the mindset. And actually, mindset is so crucial. Other technology is going to come down the line. OK, we'll probably forget talking about AI in a couple of years. It will be the latest new technology, quantum or something, you know, holographs or something else. Um, and I'm thinking as well of COVID and pandemics and future business disruption. This same process is about do we have the right mindset? 
Number two is so, so important. Do we have the buy-in from the management team, from the board? Might, whether you're two people or one, whether you're hundreds of thousands, we need that buy-in. What that doesn't mean is that they all need to be technical and they all need to totally get AI. They need, you need to help them create a kind of um, group of AI champions drawn from HR who are probably driving this and from legal and tech and marketing and sales and so on. But this project needs, and I'm sure it does have their buy-in. And number three is probably, they're not in any priority order, but I'd say number three is probably the most important because this is about, I'm not advocating that you go away and you go and buy in all these AI and HR and L&D tools. I'm suggesting you do a business case, okay? What are, let's say three, what are three opportunities or problems you have in your organization, in your team, where AI could make a difference. Set those strategic KPIs, make that process iterative. So for example, that bank I talked to you about, it was a Scandinavian bank. It failed with its chatbot a few years back, but then it iterated and used AI for much improved onboarding. So we're getting into a world where it's essential to fail and to keep iterating. But we don't want the failure to be a big cost, okay? We want to do small proofs of concept, which brings me on to number four. So doing a proof of concept, that means going away, talking, uh, looking at tools, talking to vendors, you know, doing the right documentation, getting the cohesive data ready. Number five, what I hope I'm already illustrating you know, we're coming to the last 10 minutes of, of this webinar before we break for Q&A. What I hope I've already demonstrated is how important it is to be collaborative because AI touches the product development. By getting data insights from our clients, our customers and our staff, we can change the product and service. We know that with the right insights, this is going to fundamentally change the type of sales and marketing we do. It's going to have an impact on our CX, the journey of that customer through the organization. Legal are all over this. You know, they are. I was with chief legal counsel from many of the world's big companies a few months back in Amsterdam at an association of chief legal counsel um, seminar. And it was Chatham House, so I can't obviously give away anything confidential, but they're angsting over how do we protect our teams from inadvertently violating copyright and trademarks and so on. So collaboration means having this um, group of champions from different departments so that we are addressing the impact AI is playing on our organization now and into the future. Six is exactly in your space, but all of this is in your space. Six is about, do we have the talent? Do we have tech teams, data scientists, um, that we can upskill to really take advantage of this? Do we need to hire in some skill? Do we need to outsource? Do we need to partner? And I've put in words there like, you know, funding. For those of you in the UK, um, and I'm sure this is the case in other countries too, but there are grants, talk to Innovate UK, talk to local universities. There are grants which pay 75% of a data scientist's salary for a year. You pay the other 25%. They come into your organization and they help you develop something specific, bespoke to your needs. OK, so think about the talent. Think about your culture. Yeah, which again is at the heart of what's, um, you know, what's HR's role in the organization? How do we upskill? How do we take ourselves to a much more strategic level? I asked that question at the beginning. We don't want to be dehumanized. We want to stay true to our values as an organization. 
and we don't want to be faceless. So we don't want to be using AI and HR such that nobody who wants to join our company interfaces with anybody human. So, you know, it's all of those kinds of things. Number eight, we're thinking here about agility and being open and future looking and transformative. Nine is about the wider impact. Okay, so I've already touched on this a little bit, but I work on the all party parliamentary group. And we have um, a business group, which I'm on a panel for um, enterprise adoption of AI. We hear evidence in the House of Lords every month or so from seven people from around the world. They might be politicians. Usually they're not. They're usually um, scientists, business people, you know, academics. And all of us are needing to collaborate and think about ethics, look at the EU AI Act, learn from it. Um, you know, it's, again, having people at the centre of it and safety, not discriminating against somebody because of their gender, their sexuality, you know, their ethnicity, their age, their economic disadvantage. So it's having all of that at the centre. And if it's not already in your industry sector or your country, if it's not in your company, you've got to develop it. And so I'm suggesting you play a really proactive role in helping shape what this looks like. So having an AI code of conduct for the organization, helping work with your regulator or your think tanks or your CIPD or your other trade bodies around the world and your governments. And without sounding too cynical, that can actually be a brilliant way of doing thought leadership. So, you know, being an organization that plays that role, shapes it, puts trust at the heart of it is really, really important. And then the final one is your roadmap. OK, you've got to have a strategic plan. You know, yes, it's all, it's all well and good having efficiency gains. And, you know, we want to add growth. We want to um, take our organization forward into the future. But, you know, the pace of disruption is really, really overwhelming. And we want to drive transformation and elevate the HR function. And we can do that by keeping these tools and platforms at the center because they are going to help elevate each of the different business functions that we do. And fundamentally, the product or service that we, um, you know, that we provide our uh, clients or customers with. So what I don't want you to think is great, great webinar. Um, thanks, Better Works. Thanks, Empower HR. You know, lovely to hear from Katie. And then you go away and it gets parked. Of course, there are elements of what I'm discussing that are budget hungry, chatbots, some of the other big uh, investments. So therefore, some of it is on the one year business plan, the three-year, five-year business plan. But a lot of what I'm dis discussing and sharing and the tools are free and very affordable, you know, under £50, $50 a month. Um, and so what I wanted to do is to make sure that you realise that or you, you know, accept and understand that this needs to be part of your plan now for the next six months. So I've given you a simple framework, you'll have your own templates and ways of working and styles. But, you know, go away and think about, okay, month one, what new behaviours are we going to start to, I guess, make part of our modus operandi, part of the way we function day to day? Okay, it might be using chat GPT um, to write some of our job descriptions, but fact checking them, keeping the human in the loop, reducing some time. And think about that for a moment. Chat GPT is open source. Um, many organizations, I'm thinking banks, for example, have banned it until along came some of the safe GPTs and the more bespoke tailored ones. So you wouldn't put into Chat GPT something you're not prepared to share publicly. So these open source areas are, you know, to be used wisely and carefully without sharing any confidential data. But they're amazing. 
but you've got to be able to give them a strategic brief, upload some of your documentation, get it to write, write me a 600 word blog, um, write it in this style, uh, quote this report, write it in the style of, of this journal, um, you know, write it in such a way that it addresses this geography and these cultures and so on. So, you know, it's not a level playing field. You've got to be strategic. You've got to understand how to take advantage of these tools. So the next might be some new processes. It might be the third one down. It might be have a watching brief. This, I think, is so important. So let's say you've got a, a Friday morning meeting. Maybe it's just the HR team. Maybe think about doing that once a month with a representative from a number of other departments, like legal, like marketing, like, you know, other departments, and have a watching brief on AI tools in that job function. So what's the latest development of on AI in HR? What's the latest development on AI in marketing? Go away and research some of the tools that I've mentioned, free demos, do your due diligence, get your hands dirty, you know, with some of these tools. Proofs of concept. So over the next six months, you've got to decide what does success look like? How are we going to measure our KPIs as a team? What role is AI going to play within that? And how do we stay ahead? So like I said, I'm 57, doesn't matter if you're in your 50s, 60s, 70s, doesn't matter if you're in your 20s, you might have hired people, they might have come in with a degree or an apprenticeship, and that might not have really touched on AI. I'm running a pro bono leaders of tomorrow in tech school AI program, because I'm very aware that in school, you know, I'm thinking the equivalent of what we have as A levels when you're 17, 18, and you're studying before you go to university or college. Yes, if you study data science, fantastic, technology, etc, IT, computer science. But if you study construction, telecoms, if you study media, marketing, journalism, the law, your course may not yet really be addressing the role of AI shaping that future career and shaping the way lawyers do what they do and, and so on. So you might be hiring in people and you think, oh, they're young, they get this, but they may not be fully up to speed with it. Equally, let's say male, female, you know, they may be of a certain age, 30s, perhaps 40s, where they've got a young family and they don't have the mind space to cope with this. So don't just assume because someone's young of a sort of, you know, early stage career, mid career and even later career. It's all about mindset and this journey of continuous learning. So that's really, really important. And it's HR's role to inspire, to educate, to take them on that journey, to prepare them, to address concerns, to future proof the organization. And that's why I actually think that now is an amazing time for you to use these machine learning AI tools to drive that transformation and to elevate the HR function. And I wanted to use this webinar to give you some inspiration, to bust some of those myths. You know, it's not the artificial robots taking your jobs. It's big data. It's insights. And with insights, we're able to be much more personal. So actually, we become superhuman. The HR person infused with these various tools is, you know, really going to be very, very different. And you won't be the one that gets made redundant unless you individually and you as a team and you as an organization get left behind. So, you know, it's so, so important to really consider what is AI? How is it impacting our job function? How is it impacting all of those different job functions? So I hope that's been helpful for you. Um, I was asked to speak for about 45 minutes and then give you time to ask me any questions that you might have. So, uh, yeah, feel free to connect and to um, connect with me on LinkedIn if you'd like to do that.
But um, yeah, thank you very, very much, you know, to the team. Um, Hong, thank you too. I'm sure we're going to have some interesting questions coming in now. So uh, I'll just catch my breath for a moment. <laughs> Wonderful seminar, um, Katie. We've got loads of people, kind of the common streams flying through, loads of questions coming in. Uh, folks, if you have any questions for Katie, we've set aside 15 minutes for you to do exactly that. So use the Q&A feature on the right-hand side of your screen and populate the questions there. I've got a load of questions to ask you, Katie. So if the, if the crowd is shy, we can absolutely go through it. I'm going to ask you some straight away. Firstly, I really like the vision that you have of HR being the kind of AI enabler for the rest of the organization. I think that's such a positive vision um, for the function to have. Um, uh, you know, let's not be the, organ the, the function that allows a, a sort of AI to happen to us. Uh, we need to be uh, the function that actually goes to the business and says, why don't we audit our current conditions so that we understand, are we AI ready? Um, and once we have that information, can we get to the point where we can become AI enabled? Um, who else better to do that than HR? Um, uh, we need to be the custodians for what the future of the organization looks like. And I thought you encapsulated that uh, fantastically well in your seminar, uh, Katie. Thank you. Thank Couple you. No, totally agree. It, it, and therefore, by us upskilling and looking at these tools, we're then ready to help the rest of the organization to do that and we should be really proactive in that you know rather than sort of sitting back passively waiting for other teams to come and say well we'd like this training we should be proactively thinking about that 100 and, and we've got some wonderful questions let's dive to them straight away i'm going to pop in and out of the questions i've got a few of my own which i insist on asking but i'm going to defer to the uh, the crowd to begin with um we've got a question here from enrique uh, enrique Figalo. enrique say okay uh, what would your suggestion be to promote the AI mindset? Um, because we might imagine there's some resistance to change. So, okay, it's not a small thing to try and change mm. a culture of a business. Um, how would you actually, what are the techniques or, or steps you can take uh, to try and move that mindset of the company? Yeah, that's a really, really good question because there is resistance. There's resistance because we are, Frightened. I was at a um, webinar, uh, sorry, an um, event a few days ago with a, a big bank, and the speaker before me was talking about the brain and the conscious brain and the and the subconscious brain and how important it is. You know, we are frightened of new things. I am all the time. I have to put, push myself out of my comfort zone all the time. So, I think it starts with education. It starts with education and communication are the keys. So like I said, we've got to, from the board down, we've got to be sharing the vision of the company, sharing through town halls, through team talks, et cetera. This is where we're going. Our company is changing. Our sector is changing. Your job function is changing. We are going to help take you with us on this journey. This is our vision of where we want to be. So I think it is about big picture board level sharing of vision reassurance educating and then training you know training so that and and i didn't have time to go into it but there's ai that can help you better train so ai simulations ai augmented reality etc so actually showing people what this looks like training them using ai as well as you know human ways but I think fundamentally it is about comms and education and reassurance and saying to people, you know, we are going to invest in you and upskill you and, you know, come to us. We've got an open door, you know. So I think, first of all, the board's got to really get it, you know, because if they don't get it, they're not going to share it. And then it's got to be cascading down the organization and ongoing because it's changing all the time. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, th I think we're right. It's difficult to do any kind of change without sea level sort of endorsement. Yeah. Um, but I'm strongly encouraged um, with regards to where sea level are at. I think they're probably more ahead that, as they should be than mm -hmm. other functions because they all can obviously see the uh, pr potential for productivity gains um, with regards to the implementation yeah. of this technology. So they're pushing us to do it. What we've got to do is not be the, the resistant uh, top of sort of function. HR have got to be uh, sort of uh, a hand in glove with C-level uh, to push this forward. 
Um, and I absolutely agree. Uh, L&D is something we do. Um, mm -hmm. We also know employees are really engaged in career development, skills development, and what have you. Um, yeah. That's our route in, in my opinion, um, where we can start changing that mindset by offering uh, upskilling into these new skills that people need to uh, need to have. Definitely. Um, Completely agree. Okay, cool. Let's keep going. Um, we've got another question here with from Jay, Jay, Jayashri. Uh, Jayashri is saying, I feel there's a gap in the pace of adoption between business teams and HR. Um, how can HR leaders evaluate which team, which AI tools to leverage? I think there are two questions there. Let's just mm. take the first question uh, uh, that Jay, Jayashri uh, mentioned. Is there a gap? Do you think HR are, are behind other functions? Be honest, Katie. It really we're, we're... depends. Yeah. I mean, I, I work with some incredibly progressive HR teams and I work with some that are really, really tactical and, you know, living in, in the past. You can't generalize. I think it depends on, you know, certain industry sectors are ahead of the space, aren't they? So financial services, I've been working recently quite a lot with banks and fintech, Um but I've also been working with um, construction, real estate, um, facilities management, and they're really behind. Um, so I think it, to some extent it depends on the sector. I think it also depends on seniority. I think, if I'm honest, some HR have come up through the ranks and um, have come through and haven't gone into very senior roles and haven't been as strategic as they need to be. So I think sometimes HR, certainly historically, was not the most strategic in its outlook. That's changed. I think with digitization in recent years, um, it's changed. And I've been working recently with a lot of HR managers and directors, and I've been very impressed. So I think it depends. I think that gap um, can be closed quite quickly, but it's there and it will be there in, in some organizations. What was the second part of that question? Um, I think it was a case it of, screen. yeah, I think Jay Shuri is asking like what tools to leverage. Um, we, um, so, you know, what, what particular tools? Yeah. So the start point for evaluating which tools has got to be the case, the business case. So what's our objective? What's our strategy? What does success look like? What sort of budget do we have? And then, so when you're assessing the tools, you're assessing not only AI and HR, learning and development, et cetera, you're assessing those HR AI tools, but you're also assessing what are the requirements for tools for AI across our other teams and how can we work as, so I think I would be bringing together these AI champions so that they have a watching brief on AI across the different job functions. And then as a team, the way that the, the team, the HR team can evaluate is, again, against need, against the different um, suppliers out there and their, um, their compliance, you know, their ethics, their data sets. Um, so doing your due diligence on them. But I think it has to start with your strategy, what success looks like, what your needs are, you know, what your budget is and so on. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, that sort of horizontal relationship with other departments, I think, could be a key uh, a key component to really AI enabling the rest of the organization. Okay. Can you identify the AI uh, champions within those functions and can you get together? It's almost like creating yeah. uh, a parallel structure um, and everyone pointing in the same direction. HR from, can expand its scope to do that. Absolutely. And from that team that meet weekly, monthly, whatever it might be, and I've got a watching brief like I described and are doing due diligence, they then become the ones that create the AI playbook. And yeah. then from that piece of work, potentially it might be the CEO, it might be a, a, a CMO, that person could be the one that then goes out there uh, on the round tables and is doing the thought leadership. And that can really shape the regulation because they could be like me for example joining the all party parliamentary group and helping shape um and that might be through cipd through some other trade body linked to hr in another country it might be hr teams joining the trade body for that sector you know financial conduct authority versus retail consortiums versus you know so we're coming at this at a, an HR function level and at an industry sector level and at a national level. 
and we can play a role proactively in shaping that. That sounds big and grand, but actually it's not. It's very doable. Yeah, and we should we should tick our heads up. We should we should look in that sort of post a posture, should I say, um, yeah. as a, as a function needs to be that way. Okay, Katie, a quick answer to this question, if you can. Um, this is from Tanya Bender. Tanya is saying, Katie, in your view, which area of AHR has the greatest potential for AI implementation at this point in time? So let's be brutal on this. Let's just select an area where you think mm. that actually. In HR, this particular function is ideally suited for some AI uh, tooling right now. Yeah, I think um, the learning and development is key and the talent acquisition. I've gone for two there, haven't I? But I think um, tools to attract because talent acquisition is big at the moment, isn't it? We've had the big resignation. We've had post-COVID issues. I think being able to use affordable HR tools for great talent acquisition is really, really important. But equally, the same sort of tools potentially could be used for, for the training and development. Some of the training and development is a little bit expensive, but some of the same tools could be used for that purpose as well. So... Yeah, and we're getting a lot of comments on, on in the both in the in the comment thread and also in the question in the Q and A function um, about sort of you know budget concerns and you know which tool this that and the other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think the, the reality is these are really tough times. I think all companies yeah. are looking to optimize, um, but the way in which I think HR can make the business case is to say the implementation of some technologies can really improve the productivity of the organization. Yeah and will pay off the investment much sooner than you think. Yeah. Um, and, you know, maybe there's a lot of people out there that don't want to increase the tech stack and have lots of different tools floating around in their organization. This is where, uh, you know, a product like BetterWorks might actually be yeah. very suitable. Um, uh, you can get a much bigger platform that sits uh, into the business at the core of the business and does things like the performance management, and it will inherently have AI-enabled features within this group. One thing that has been true um, over the last 12, 18 months or so is that we've seen all product, all, all product vendors essentially infuse their products with um, AI features. Um, so maybe you don't want to pick and choose some of these more consumer grade mm. stuff because it can get a bit messy and we don't know where the privacy issue is and we, we, we don't have a sense of control and ownership. You know what? People at the enterprise level are producing some really uh, significant at desk type of s services uh, that can really elevate the, the, the work that you're doing. Absolutely. Um, but I completely agree on, you know, on the better works front that that's, you know, it's those kinds of tools that we've really got to. Uh, you know, look into and, and get all of the benefits, you know, from from that. That's just so fundamental to it, I think, you know, the sort of gains that we'll get from that and the payback that you mentioned are, you know, a quick um, and that's so, so important as well. So, yeah, definitely. Katie, I'm going to reserve the final question for myself. Um, <laughs> so um, uh, let's do a scenario. Uh, scenario is I feel like I work for a laggard. Um, so I'm working for a company I feel that they're, they're slow adopting, they're not moving fast enough. What, what should I do? What's the first thing I need to do to try and shift um, this, you know, it seems like a bit of an oil tanker of, 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 yeah. of a culture. How do I move it? I'm a HR director. I'm a HR leader, uh, but I'm working for Laggard. What do yeah, I do? you've got to share, haven't you? So I remember doing an MBA and sharing my re research with exactly that kind of an organization. And you have to try, you know, you have to... to um, show you have to do some training with them get a board slot you know get a 15 20 minute slot in in their agenda um do it in such a way that it, it, it's it's easy for them to digest don't blind them with the science educate them about right this is us today this is what where we could be this is what sort of our competitors are doing this is how this is impacting you know performance management etc cetera, etc cetera. And, and i think you have to go in positively and try you know, fundamentally, it might not quite work. They might not be ready. They might take a few more years, but you have to do some education, maybe a small proof of concept. We did this. this Katie, we have to put it there. Um, time to go. Wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you so much for your presentation. My pleasure. Thank you for helping curate it.